This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We now deal with the topic of change management. We've already seen how certain changes could be designed. Uh, we know that there is automation, rationalization, business process re-engineering. Uh, we have looked at maybe swim lane diagrams to see if we could uh, make something more efficient. Uh, but having decided on the change, this means that you have to uh, encourage maybe primarily employees, but also sometimes other stakeholders to deal with the change, to, to maybe change their ways of behaving or working. And that's the subject of change management. And it's quite important because uh, if uh, particularly a key stakeholder uh, digs their heels in and says, I don't want that change, then of course, uh, it could uh, lead to great difficulties. It could maybe maybe you have to abandon that that particular strategy, or in <coughs> or perhaps in the interim, uh, that there is going to be some sort of um, um, uh, confrontation uh, with employees. So the first theory we have here, uh, Balogun and Hope Haley, they call it a kaleidoscope of change. Uh, it looks very complicated, uh, but what they're trying to say is that around the outside here, this uh, pink, uh, this is what they call a context of uh, change, and that's like the variables uh, relating to change. And then inside, in the very center in blue, you have what they call the design choices. And it's called a kaleidoscope of change because a kaleidoscope is one of those now probably rather old-fashioned toys. Uh, you could look through it like a telescope, you could rotate the end, uh, and you've got a kind of symmetrical patterns coming out. Uh, here the idea is that as the uh, context of change varies, uh, those are the variables uh, associated with the uh, change situation, then you can uh, perhaps adopt different change choices. Uh, to make sense of this, uh, rather than keeping it in this circle, what we'll do is simply list out what's in the pink and what's in the blue. And the next slide links out, uh, or lists out, uh, essentially what is in the, the pink. These are the contextual features. And if you ever see in a question uh, something to do with the contextual features of change, then this is a very heavy hint. Uh, to use Balogun and Hope Haley. Contextual, is, uh, this is the, the only theory really in which the word contextual is going to come up. Inevitably, when we're talking through these variables, we have to maybe make reference a little bit uh, to some of the design choices. First variable, time. How urgent is a change? Or is it one that we can be far more uh, relaxed about? Some changes are urgent. You might be simply running out of cash, uh, or you might be rapidly losing market share, or a competitor has launched a, a, a radical product which you're kind of very uh, kind of worried about, and you can't hang around uh, before you defend your own market share. If a change is urgent, uh, almost in the nature of an emergency change, then probably what you're going to have to tell people is just do it. Uh, you haven't got uh, really the luxury of time to have lots of meetings, discussions, participation, and so on. If, however, uh, you have a longer-term change, which you see coming up, uh, then uh, you can be more relaxed about your uh, approach to change. Uh, and maybe what you do then is you have a kind of consultation period. You try to get everybody on side, hear everyone's views, uh, and try to put the change through in, in, in that way. Scope. How much of the organization is affected? If you have a very large change affecting all of the organization, uh, then, as we know, uh, there is a danger that many stakeholders are going to be damaged if it goes wrong, or many sh uh, stakeholders might object, of course. Uh, and it's got to be complex changes as well. So you might well be advised, if it's a, a, a very large or fundamental scope, that a more participative approach might be required. 
Uh, again, we have to get everyone understanding what the change is. Uh, we almost uh, have to get them on our side in case it does go wrong a little bit. We need their patience almost uh, to get it right. And maybe we need their advice. A very complex change. Uh, it's unlikely that one person at the top will be able to see all the factors uh, which are relevant to that change. And if you took a kind of dictatorial effect, I've decided to change, here it is, and you're all going to change, there's a very high probability that you might get it wrong. Preservation. Uh, what aspects uh, uh, of the current organisation do you want to preserve? Uh, so our staff morale might be very high. If our staff morale is high, that's normally taken as a, a, a good resource. Uh, and you put a change through, uh, which irritates staff, and staff morale goes, uh, and maybe people start leaving, or maybe they uh, start being less helpful to customers and so on, uh, then you haven't managed to change very well. Diversity. Two meanings, really, in the diversity uh, here. Uh, first is, uh, people in different departments in the organisation tend to have very different backgrounds and skills and personalities. Uh, so people in the accounting department tend to be quite good at reading instructions, following the kind of letter of the law and following it through. They've been reading about, you know, accounting standards and uh, finance regulations and uh, tax regulations and so on. They're quite good at following written instructions. Just for example, maybe people in the sales department uh, are probably people who like to interact more with uh, people on a, an individual basis. They're not quite perhaps so interested in reading instructions. They're quite happy to debate instructions and to be taught. And when we're thinking of how are we are going to teach people what the change is, maybe we need to adopt different methods. Maybe we can simply give the people in the accounting department uh, two sheets of paper uh, explaining it and they kind of read that and digest it. Maybe for people in the sales department what we want is a bit of a meeting uh, and people can kind of discuss it, air their views and that's how we get the message across there. The second meaning of diversity is uh, what is the history within the organisation of seeing change? So if we look at uh, an organisation uh, which uh, always recruits uh, people when they're very young. And most people stay in the organization kind of almost for a lifetime. They rarely recruit managers from outside and, and they're quite, quite proud of their methodology, so to speak. There is the right way. Uh, they've never really been exposed to other ways of uh, carrying out processes and they tend to be quite resistant. Uh, we've always done it this way. Why should we change? But if you have an organisation which is much more kind of pluralistic, managers come in at all levels, there's quite a turnover of uh, staff within the organisation, many staff have seen other ways of accomplishing tasks because they're probably much more open to change. They're, they're, they're less uh, convinced that there is only the one way to, to achieve what has to be achieved. <coughs> Capability. Do we have the abilities to put through the change. Uh, there was one famous uh, merger of two UK supermarket companies. Uh, one had been predominantly active in the north of the country, the other had been predominantly active in the south of the country. It was a very good match, but their IT systems were, were completely uh, separate and really quite incompatible, and they weren't going to get any of the economies of scale re relating to inventories until they, they, they had really this, these, these IT systems combined. And what they did was they looked at the, the two IT directors from the old supermarkets and they made one of them the director of the new group. Uh, but this person simply uh, had very few skills in the job of integrating two systems. They had been perfectly good at running a supermarket uh, IT system, uh, you know, gra gradual uh, increases in maybe what it uh, could do. But when it came to actually integrating two very different systems, they, they really didn't know how to go about it. The company would have been far better bringing in consultants from outside or employing a team of people, especially for a while. I think capacity speaks for itself. Uh, do we have the capacity? Do we have the time? Do we have the people? Uh, do we have the money? 
And again, sometimes uh, having temporary consultants being employed will relieve some of the work pressure on handling the change. Uh, quite obviously, if you're very short of time, uh, then you maybe have to rush it through again. Maybe you, you have to try and get get uh, um, temporary people in. Uh, if you're short of cash, uh, then maybe you can't afford to do that. Uh, if you're short of cash, again, uh, short of time, you can't have too much participation. You have to kind of tell people to get on with it. Readiness. This is uh, very important. It, it's often assumed that uh, certain employees will tend to resist change. And they resist change for all sorts of perfectly understandable reasons. They fear, for example, they would lose their jobs. They fear they will have a different job, which isn't as pleasant for them. Uh, they feel that their current social group at work is going to be kind of redistributed. They're going to kind of lose their friends at work, uh, so to speak. They may be frightened that they won't be able to cope with the new demands from the new job. And so people are, are very often resistant to change, resistant to becoming flexible. And if that is the case, then you ha have to put in uh, really design choices which tries to overcome that resistance. Occasionally, of course, people will be crying out for change. They see, you know, the organization is not performing well, uh, and in that, in that case, you'll be pushing out an open door, and it'll be much easier for you to uh, implement the change. And finally, power. Do you have the power to put through the change? Obviously, if you are the, the owner, the kind of power culture boss person, you can just tell people what to do, otherwise they're liable to lose their jobs. But in some other organizations, uh, a, a more junior manager <coughs> might have the task delegated uh, to them, uh, and they put, try to put through the change and people below them, uh, and these people begin kind of leapfrogging over that manager and complaining to the bosses above, undermining the power of that manager. So it's quite important, if you are going to be putting through change, to let everyone know this is the person who's going to be putting through the change, if you have complaints or problems, go and see this person. Don't kind of leapfrog them, try to cut them out of the chain and come above it. So those are what you can call the contextual features, or I like to call them the variables of change. Every change is going to be slightly different in terms of these variables. And then, uh, as a result of these variables, uh, what are the design uh, choices? And the first one they call the change path at uh, time scales. Yeah, pretty obviously an urgent change has to be done very quickly. The extent of change. And again an urgent change, what you might have to do is to do a very limited change very quickly. Uh, whereas if you are having a longer kind of deadline, a longer opportunity to put through the change, then you might decide, well, I won't just change it in one department, I'll take my time and I'll change the whole organization there. You'll be looking at the outcomes. You may have to limit your outcomes depending on your budget, uh, depending on people's resistance to change, depending on the uh, uh, abilities and capacity of people to put the change through. The next two I tend to, think, to almost think of nearly the, the same, the change start point and the change style. Uh, think uh, of an organization where we uh, fear perhaps that uh, we know a change is needed uh, but we fear perhaps that uh, the employees are going to be a bit resistant uh, to that. Uh, the two extreme choices are we at the top see the changes needed and we adopt a very uh, autocratic management style and top-down management style uh, and we tell people what to do. Now, generally speaking, if people are a bit resistant, you tell them what to do, they kind of fight back a little bit. So what might be an alternative is to say to people, look, uh, we have a problem here, we're losing uh, customers, we don't seem to be providing what they wanted to buy from us. What do you think? Uh, what are your suggestions for change and survival? And perhaps try to get the change becoming more bottom-up, that people come up with good ideas. Uh, and also, instead of being very autocratic, you become much more participative. Uh, and to some extent, it's a way of maybe overcoming the resistance. Because once someone has suggested a change, 
it's their idea, it's very hard for them subsequently to resist that change. Change interventions, uh, education, explaining why the change is needed, communication, explaining the extent of the change, explaining maybe that everyone's job is safe, uh, gets rid of a lot of the fear, telling people there will be a, a program of training uh, so you can learn to use a new software, maybe it takes a lot of the fear out of the change again. Cultural interventions, how do we get people to treat customers better? Maybe, maybe there's a course where there's a lot of kind of role playing which is going on within it. And then there is who's going to do uh, the, the change, uh, who's going to be in charge of the change, the change uh, manager in some, some ways. Uh, are we going to get consultants in from outside? Are we going to have a team of people drawn from various departments who are going to oversee the change? And again, again, that could be political. Everyone seems to be participating in the change. But it might also be safe. A complex change of high scope, you probably want a team to put the change through uh, so that you understand the pr problem properly. Simpler models of change management. We have Lewin's force field analysis. And Lewin saw that on one side you have forces for change. Uh, it could be uh, the internet, it could be a force for change. It could be a change in exchange rates, it could be a change in the law, it could be a change in the economy. All sorts of things can make organisations have to change different customer demands simply. And by and large, on one side, what you're going to have, let's say, is a director's and management. These people are doing their jobs properly, looking at a strategy of the company, they should be the first ones to see that a change is needed. So they try to put through the change. Uh, and what uh, we're supposed to kind of imagine in, in this is there's considerable reluctance or resistance from from uh, people to change, whether it's employees or whether it's uh, customers. Uh, and so you get uh, managers kind of going that way, the employees going that way. And of course, if they're very well organized employees, maybe with a, uh, a strong trade union and so on, then you get a, a kind of fight going on there, there's a standoff, uh, and then you begin to get work to rules, and you begin to get strikes, the whole thing kind of escalates, and then, then no one is kind of willing to give way because it's a loss of face. What Lewin says, instead of having this head-to-head -head confrontation, what you should work on is trying to weaken the resistance to change, weaken these resisting forces, and the four ways in which you can do that are these. First of all, educate people, tell people, explain to people why the change is needed. If you explain to people that we you know we're losing customers, the cash flows go into negative territory, if we don't do something soon we're going to have to start closing down factories or making people redundant, uh, uh, then then you know, that, that is obviously going to weaken resistance to change rather than just a kind of unexplained change coming out of the, uh, the blue. Secondly, and very powerful, is participation. I've mentioned this before. Uh, participation is a very almost motivating way of managing people. People uh, feel good about being uh, asked their opinion. Uh, you, 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 you're consulted, you give your opinion, you feel you are, in, to some extent, influencing your destiny. Uh, and then uh, when you make a suggestion and it's adopted, uh, you know, it's your suggestion, you're going to be, uh, in, you know, keen for it to go through. You, you know, you're not going to be resisting it. And participation has been shown in experiments to be extremely good uh, at easing the path of change. Communication, I've also uh, mentioned uh, communication, tell people what the change is going to be. Uh, uh, what's actually going to happen is maybe far less serious, far less unpleasant than the rumours that are going around the organisation. Finally, uh, there's a technique of trying to envision the future. All change, even if it's welcome, tends to be hard. Uh, you're having to learn new tricks, you're having to get used to being a new boss. 
you're having maybe to get used to a new IT system and for a while you have to keep the two systems working parallel so that's extra work so what you can say to people is look we're going to have a horrible three months you know some of your colleagues uh, are going to lose their jobs you're going to be reorganized you're going to have to learn a new method of working with a new IT system we know it's going to be a horrible three months but after that things will be better the company will be stable the company will be secure your jobs will be secure and once you get used to this new software you find it actually reduces the amount of work you have to do it makes your job far easier so it's a kind of vision of the promised land really which you're, you're holding out just get through this change and things will be much better but of course that 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 requires education and communication to hold up your your vision your picture of this new method of working the third uh, method of change again is a lure one very similar in many ways uh, to the force field model on freeze effective changes refreeze so on freeze is kind of softening people up if you like uh, people have been doing the same things for the last 10 years uh, they have to be educated you have to communicate with them uh, you have to get them ready for uh, change. Then you put through the change. That could be training, reorganization, and so on. Quite a, quite a, as I said, quite a torrid period. Uh, people uncertain, lacking confidence, frightened, what's going to happen, and so on. But then you have to refreeze it. And refreezing has got two effects. First of all, you don't want people kind of sliding back into the old methods. So if the change was to improve customer service and the affecting the changes, you put people in lots of courses about how to speak to customers nicely on the telephone. Uh, you don't want them going back to old habits where they're a bit, a bit, a bit short and nasty to people on the phone. You want to make sure that the new system has kind of settled down as a normal system. But the second meaning of uh, refreeze is uh, that after this period of change, when things are difficult, you must let things settle down. Because it's only when things settle down and people get used to new methodology, confident with it, efficient with it, that you, they actually reap the rewards. It's almost like giving people a rest uh, after the change. There are some organizations which always are in a continual state of change. They put through one organizational change and people work hard. Then immediately there's another organizational change and people are working hard again. They never get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. So refreezing, let it settle down, see how it operates, give people some reward from this extra effort is important. Finally, uh, we have to consider the role of what's uh, called a change agent. A uh, change agent is almost like the manager in charge of the change. Uh, it, is, it gives effect to the uh, strategic change, is in charge of it, if you like. And very often companies go out and employ consultants to do this. This is uh, part of the capability area. Uh, the, the, you know, change uh, might be happening once every few years, change the IT system might be happening once every few years. Why do you think there's necessarily somebody in the organization with the expertise to do it? Uh, so so sometimes you go outside and get the consultant in for, for those purposes. But the, 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 the whole purposes are as follows. First of all, if you get a consultant in whose job is to put through strategic change, this is their job. They might be visiting 10, 12 organizations a year to try to put through changes. And they know the importance of education, participation, communication, envisioning the future. They know that people will be worried. They know that they uh, require maybe meetings with people to, to, to hear their views and people can voice their concerns and so on. They should just be good at doing change. Secondly, uh, they can also give advice on what sort of change is needed. So they're brought into an organization to change maybe the management structure. And they can say, well, I was dealing with uh, an organization in another town. Uh, and it was dealing with uh, projects, building bridges. And what we suggested there 
was they went in for matrix management. Uh, and you are also dealing in uh, projects. And really, I think uh, we should consider for you the idea of changing to matrix management. So they're bringing in expertise about what the change should be, because that's not necessarily always available in a company. If, if all it's ever seen, for example, is a kind of hierarchical management, the normal kind of functional organizational chart, uh, the, the consultant's bringing in something outside their experience, which might be just right for them. Third point is they're perceived uh, to be independent and fair. Uh, the problem is if you give a manager within the organization responsibility for change, uh, do you understand that it's probably unlikely that that manager would want to reverse a decision that he or she had made in the past? Uh, you're, you're, you know, you've made a number of management decisions. One of them has maybe been wrong or maybe needs to be changed, not because it was wrong at the time. But, but if you kind of change it, you're almost admitting maybe you got it wrong. So, so that's not great. Uh, second thing is people suspect that his manager in charge of change will be making the perfect job for him or herself. And third, uh, people say, well, that manager never liked me. What I'm going to end up with is an awful job, or I'm going to be the one picked for redundancy. This manager will want to get their own back on, on me. When a consultant comes in from outside, they come in with a clean pair of hands without the suspicion of prejudice or bias and so on. They will look at all the options equally. They'll know that they will not be hanging on to some of them because they're particularly proud of what's uh, been done in the past. Uh, they will hold no grudges against the employees. They're not producing a good job for themselves. And this independence can be very powerful. And finally, uh, when we're looking at uh, risk management, uh, we should think all changes have risks associated with them. Uh, risk that the new IT system doesn't work well, nobody likes a new internet system, uh, the just-in-time inventory system doesn't work well, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, sometimes management looks at the risk and says, well, that's maybe a bit much for me to take on. I will, in a way, subcontract that. I will subcontract it to a firm of consultants and if the new system doesn't work then they won't be paid. But certainly for any substantial change it makes sense to have help uh, so, so that the consultant comes in and maybe together you do the change and you share the risk of it going wrong.